Hello, welcome to another edition of Astronomy for Everyone. My name is Dr. Timothy Day, and it's my distinct pleasure to be substituting for our usual host, Don Glazier. Don should be back for the next episode. The topic tonight is an exciting one. Meteorites, pieces of space we can actually touch. And our expert tonight is Sandra Masika. Welcome, Sandra, and tell us a little bit about yourself. How is it that you came to have this wonderful collection and all the knowledge we have about what you're going to talk about? Thank you, Tim. I've been interested in space and mete meteor showers and meteorites basically ever since high school. And I worked for seven years for NASA while I was oh, in California wow. doing meteor studies. And since then, I've started collecting my meteorites and tektites. That's wonderful. How long have you been collecting them for? Uh, let's see, my first one I got in 2007, I would say. Okay. And now I have a collection of 70, approximately 70 if it, meteorites and tektites combined. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. So I'm going to start by talking about the meteorites. And first I'll describe the difference. We have two different, uh, actually three different sections. And the first section is differentiated meteorites. Okay. And that's um, uh, like our planet is differentiated, meaning that the planet, uh, our planet or any planet that might be the body of uh, one of these meteorites is in layers where it was big enough and therefore hot enough for the the metal to sink to the center, to become liquid enough for gravity to pull it to the center, and then we have basically the mantle and, and much of the earth, the, the most of the earth in the next layer, and then very thin on the surface is the crust. It's almost like our own planet Earth and the, a lot of exactly the other like rocky it. planets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so metal in the middle that may still be hot, and then rocky outer part, and then the very thin crust. Same thing for the meteors that form these meteorites. The, same for the parent bodies. The, the parent bodies. Uh, okay. That form these meteorites. Yes. And, and we call those, they could be something like an asteroid or uh, like a, what we call a planetesimal, meaning a very small planet. Um, I think many of us know that we have eight planets and five dwarf planets now, so we've got these 13 planets. But before, when the solar system was first starting, there were thousands or maybe even you know, millions of, of these planetesimals. And some of them were big enough to become differentiated, which is the first part I'll talk about, and others weren't, which I'll, I'll talk about next. But the, so those planets before our uh, uh, 13 planets, the eight and the, and the five, we had um, these many planets that basically kept crashing into each other, and sometimes they would stick together and, right. and start forming larger planets, right. and sometimes they would crash into each other and break up into millions of pieces. And those pieces would then become uh, meteor, meteors, meteoids, sorry, and those would eventually come and become a meteorite or a meteor. Okay. Have you ever seen a shooting star in the sky, Tim? I've been lucky enough to catch one now and again. It's always exciting. Uh huh. Well, I, I don't know that if everyone knows here. I know that you know this, but that a shooting star is actually not a star at all. It can be something like a rock like this, or or um, if this is a piece of metal. It could be a piece of metal. It can be a rock or something even as small as a grain of sand. And that's like floating out in the atmosphere or in the outer space. Right. And then if our Earth collides with that, when it hits our atmosphere, it's the meteor or shooting star that we see is actually the piece going. And it's not the piece itself burning, but the air around it is burning. Because, of course, you can't light fire to metal or rock. It doesn't burn. It's the air around the friction between the, the rock or metal and the air causes the air to burn. And that's what we see in that streak. That's the air burning around the meteorite coming, a meteor, soon to be meteorite. Right, and so when you see a shooting star, that's a meteor, and if it actually lands, it's called a meteorite. Now so that's I what understand. we have here, the meteorites. Thank you. And sometimes when you see the streak like that, if it just goes away really fast, it's the air that's burning. But sometimes if you see a rather large one, the streak will actually stay there. And that can be the case where, although this doesn't 
ever burn. It can get hot enough if it's large enough and going fast enough and has enough time in the atmosphere where it can actually start to melt. And that liquid metal will then be left there in the trail. And that's what we, see. when you see a, a, a lasting trail, it's because the, the metal has- The persistence is from little droplets of liquid metal staying behind as the main body races ahead. Exactly. Okay, wonderful. So the first meter I'm gonna talk about is um, this one, which is a piece of metal, nickel iron. And most people, when when they touch it or hold it, the first thing they notice is it's really heavy. It is, it's surprisingly heavy for what the size is. Uh huh. And in these examples that you and I have, and I, I think we have a picture of it here, you can see that there's one or two surfaces of this that is um, the natural surface. And then we've cut that open so you can see uh, in the picture here, I get, in the one I'm holding, you can see one of the natural surfaces and, and it's kind of hidden on the other side of the other meteorite. But they've cut this open so we can see what it looks like on the inside. And you'll notice these patterns in here and where they cut this open and, and what they've done is they've, they've polished it and given it a metal etch so we can actually see these lines and they're very special, these lines. Uh, it's called the Wittmannstatten pattern because there was a guy in Austria named Wittmannstatten who generally gets the credit for figuring out about these patterns and um, understanding what they are. I'm looking at the metal but I'm seeing these little crystals, different sizes, you know, but on every cut and etch service, they're there without without any problem. Easy to see. The rough outer side that hasn't been manipulated, that's how it looked when it was still in space? Uh, well, it got More a little bit of burn. A little know, burn little on the way in. There's a very thin amount that, that where you get like a fusion crust. But it's remarkable to see the crystals everywhere else. Right, and there's only one way that these crystals can be formed. And that is when you have nickel iron, which this is made of. Right. And you have it molten or liquid, right. and it cools down very, very slowly over millions of years. Wow. And there's no way that we can actually do that in a laboratory on Earth because we don't have millions, millions of, of years. years. And, and the only way we know of that these can occur then is in the core of a planet. And so when um, it, it's because of the differences between the nickel and the iron a little bit that they form these. And so if, if we see this pattern, there's only one way that this can come, again, from the core of a planet and from a differentiated planet. Mm -hmm. And it can't come from Earth because we know our core has not cooled down and hardened like this yet. Okay. So we know that this is a meteorite. There's lots of meteorites who don't have this, but because there's many other types besides the, the ones that come from the core. Right. But uh, if we see this, we know it's definitely. So a this is the absolute proof that you have a meteorite, something that used to be inside a planet at one time and then got freed up by a collision and then eventually found its way into our atmosphere, into the ground, somebody picked it up and there's the proof. It's not just another rock on the ground. It used to be in outer space in the center of, a, of another planetesimal. Exactly. And the, the another one I have here, you'll notice the two that we've looked at so far, the Wittmannstatten Vid pattern is exactly the same. It's kind of like a fingerprint where at first if you look at like fingerprints, it's all like ridges and skin, they look exactly the same. Right. But we know each fingerprint is unique. And so each planet, when its core cools down, the Wittmannstatten pattern, although they look very similar, it's unique. So I don't know if we can look back at that picture real quick of the of the the three different ones I have that show the Wittmannstatten pattern. And you'll see that the third one, the, the one I'm holding now, although it looks very similar, the, the pattern is different. Okay, so they, they can, they absolutely prove it used to be at the middle of a molten, differentiated planetoid or something, something big enough to have layers like our Earth, but also small enough to have gotten busted up. A piece came to Earth. We look at this really unique pattern in the center, unique to each asteroid, I would imagine. And then exactly. we know, for example, this absolutely came from the molten core of an asteroid at some point or other. And these two, we know not only that they're from a core, but these two, because the Wittmannstatten pattern matches, and also because we found them in the same place, um, 
we know these came from the same meteorite, the same core of the same planet. And this one, these two were found in Africa. Uh, this one was found in Sweden. And the next one I'll talk about is the, the jewelry I'm wearing. You I, do, you have some jewelry on. Um, the, I didn't mention before, this ring is also one from Africa. But the, the, the jewelry that I'm, the other jewelry I'm wearing, the necklace and the earrings, these came from Russia. And this one, well, these, we found them. Well, they were, you know, somebody dug them up or, or whatever. These, we actually saw the fall. It was in Russia in 19, I didn't, as in we, but people saw it in 1947. Um, and it was a huge, huge event. The, when this meteor came into Russia, well, it was still a meteor. They said it was brighter than the sun. And the trail that was left was stood, stayed there for hours. That's wonderful. And, and you can see on this one that there's the, what they call uh, regmaglyphs, which look like little thumbprints in the surface of it. And I don't know if that picture, I think you can see that in, in the picture, that there's little teeny thumbprints in here. Once again, it makes it unique. It proves its source. You, you've authenticated it. At this point, I'd like to take a quick break. We're going to break for Steve Woody doing Term of the Month, and then we'll be right back. The Term of the Month for December 2016 is Comet Enki. Comet Enki was discovered and first recorded in 1786, but it wasn't recognized as periodic until 1819, and that's when it was computed, its orbit was computed by Johann Franz Enki. That is, the calculator, rather than the discoverer, it was used to name the comet, just like Comet Halley. In fact, this was the second periodic comet uh, where this was done. Comet Enki gets as close as 26 million kilometers to the Earth, or 16 million miles. Close approach to the Earth happens about every 33 years. The orbit of Comet Enki is changed by outgassing from the comet itself, or by interactions with the gravity of various planets. Could such a, a comet affect the Earth? One idea is that it has. In 1918, in Tunguska, Siberia, there was this explosion that flattened 2,000 square kilometers, or 770 square miles of forest, but left no crater. And this is the behavior expected from a chunk of a comet. It may have been from Enki. Meteor showers are generally safe, but the streaks of light that are caused by little sand-sized bits mostly come from comets. But it is quite possible that they aren't so safe. That's the term of the month for December 2016, Comet Enki. Welcome back to Astronomy for Everyone. We were talking with Sandra Masika about the different types of meteorites that exist and that she has in her collection. And we were just finishing up the different kinds of metallic meteorites. The next sample is amazing. Sandra, would you take us in and show us what it is? Okay, this is the last one I have that's from the nickel iron group. And this one's really different because it's almost completely nickel. And those patterns, as I mentioned, are, are from the difference with the nickel and the iron. And this one, since it's almost completely nickel, doesn't have the, um, the Widmanstatten pattern on it at all. This one's from Russia. And in the picture, you can see the large one that someone has in their, their hand. That's another real good example of the regmalift, so those thumbprint-type depressions that you see. I could see the camera and the reflection of the other one, the camera. Yeah, camera. it's just a, it's that's like a mirror. Like a mirror, exactly like what a mirror. What a wonderful specimen. So what do you have that's next for us? Okay, the next one is called a palisite, and this one goes in between the layer of the um, of the core and the rest of the the mantle. So it's at the, the boundary between mm -hmm. the metal and the rock. Yeah, and what's interesting about this one is just one how beautiful it is when you hold it up the light. You can see the light through it. Oh yeah, uh, it's a very thin slice and. You can see that it actually has bits of nickel iron. And if you look at this very closely, you can actually see the Wittmannstatten pattern in the nickel iron okay, there. Okay, yeah. And, and the rest of it has olivine And the color in the and, rock, the yeah. olivine and whatnot. It's very That's beautiful. beautiful. And the last one in the category of the differentiated meteorites is this one, which is from the crust. 
and you can see these layers here and you can see different rocks that have been excuse me crunched together here to to form this sample and this these patterns that you're seeing here uh, if you have things like plate tectonic volcanic changes in the landscape wind erosion uh, a rain erosion then this would not exist anymore so this is another example where we have proof that this comes from a, uh, another planet because this must come from a planet that does not have uh, plate tectonic and volcanic action and, and wind and rain erosion. Take us into the next step. Okay, the next group I'm gonna talk about are the chondrites. And they are from the undifferentiated type of planet. And so, or planetesimal, I should say. It's not as big as the planets we have A now. A small planet. Right, and this one is even smaller and not as hot as the previous, the differentiated ones we were talking about. It's more homogeneous, where the, the material is th basically the same all the way through it instead of in layers like the other one is. Okay. And it w did get hot enough to cause little bits of metal to become like little spots. I can see little beads on the image on the TV screen. Right, and, and the, the reason these are called chondrites, it's um, from a Greek word of chondrule that, uh, that means a little grain or, or a so that granule. Makes sense. That's what we're seeing. So we're seeing these little spots on it. And this, this is a nice sample because it's got like all different kinds of spots. And the, what's really exciting about the chondrites is that uh, these astronomers and scientists are so excited about this because it's very close to what our solar system was like as the planets were first forming. Because once the planets have gone through different differentiation, um, different differentiation. Tation, yes, thank you. <laughs> then uh, they've changed everything. The melting has changed, you know, yes. the, what the format of it is. And so this um, is very close to what the solar nebula was like. So it's a time capsule of how things were, and so that's very important to scientists to understand helping us to understand what was it like back at the beginning of the solar system. Yes, and the other one that I have here is just another example. Both of these happen to be from Morocco, and, and they're both nice examples where you can see the little chondrules in them. Wonderful, what do you have for us next? The next are te tectites, and they're not meteorites, but they were actually caused by meteorites. And not just any meteorite, it has to be a really, really big meteorite, like the kind that they think uh, killed off the dinosaurs 65 million years oh, ago. Oh, so a planet killer almost, something enormous. Right. It doesn't have to be quite that big, but it's in that range where it's, it's far bigger than... Everybody than knows it happened. So, so when you have a big, big meteorite like that coming in, it's coming so fast and it lands so hot that it actually melts the dirt, the earth, underneath it. Right. And then that liquid earth splashes up into the sky and actually leaves the atmosphere. Wow. And then cools down and hardens down again. And then in rain, space it cools? Yes, it leaves, leaves our atmosphere so it's in space. So molten when it goes up, cools, freezes, and then rains back down. Exactly. That's amazing. And and so they, it, it it's not a meteorite, and it's not from outer space, but it's caused by a meteorite, and it was in outer space when it got splashed and up. So and so it deserves to be in our collection. Do you have some examples to show us? Yes, and these are called tectites, if I didn't say that. Tectites. tectites. And I have three different types here, and the first one I'll talk about is the Moldavite. And these are really pretty. They come from Czechoslovakia, and they're, you know, you can you can see right through them. Do you know, Tim, how they make glass? Well, usually it's molten sand somehow, yes, right? Yes, you, you heat up sand to a high temperature. There's other ingredients in it, right. but basically sand. And so if you heat up sand to make glass, when you heat up dirt, you're going to get... Dirty glass. Dirty glass, exactly. And that's why this, although it looks clear ah. um, it's not it's perfect clear like it's glass tinted. Would be. it has a green color it's not pure and and the picture we have here there's two of the tectites of, of the moldavite type that are shown there and they're not the exact samples that I have but these are very close to it and uh, so so these are actually made I of can glass. definitely see the light coming through the back 
Now, the next type I have is Indochinites, and this was a huge, huge event. When these came raining down, they landed in uh, Indonesia and China and Thailand. Southeast it, Asia. Basically, Big yes. Time. Okay. And, and if this same event had happened and landed like right in the middle of of North of United States, yeah. the pieces that were raining down would have covered the entire uh, continental United States. So that gives us down. an idea about how much of Southeast Asia was involved in this splash. Right, exactly. And the very last type I have is is not exactly a tektite because um, it it didn't splash up into outer space like right. the other ones. When when the meteorite came down and landed, it melted the, the sand underneath. This is called Libyan glass. So, so it was much more close to the pure sand that you make glass from, uh -huh. the deserts of Libya. And, and it just stayed underneath the meteorite. And so we have this Libyan glass, which... Um, it has been around for a very long time. When they opened up King Tut's tomb, they found a piece of jewelry, like a, a, a necklace, and the centerpiece of this necklace. So on, on this piece of, of art from Tutankhamun's tomb, yes. they knew the value of this. Yes. They knew that somehow this was very special, and so it deserved to be at the center of this elaborate, expensive uh, piece of art made, exactly. for, made for the uh, King Tutankhamun. And the Tutankhamun piece is not in your personal collection, I take it. No. no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so that's a wonderful journey you've taken in this through. You, we understand now what a meteor and a meteorite is, and we have a good understanding that a lot of meteorites came from much bigger pieces, planetoids, and they formed uh, a, a liquid core and a mantle on a crust like our earth still has and then that fractured and we've got distinct metal pieces distinct rocky pieces pieces that splashed into space and came back down pieces that got me melted but never did go into space and uh we have a wonderful understanding now about why we see what we see how we know it's really a meteor or meteorite and then the different types that's been a wonderful trip Thank you so much for educating us in this way. I had no idea about these things. You're uh, welcome, Tim. Yeah, well, it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, let, I want to let our viewers know all our shows are linked on our website. Uh, you will find the website and the email address through which you can ask us questions about this show or even other topics. We'll be very happy to respond to you. And now what I want to do is uh, say thank you again and go to Steve for What's Up in the Sky. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. What's up in the night sky for December 2016? In December, the sun rises between 7.43 and 8.02 across the month and sets from 5.01 to 5.11 across the month. And it's not much time difference because we have the winter solstice on December 21st. So the days are getting shorter than longer. The moons start with a first quarter moon on the 7th of December, and then the full moon comes on the 13th, the third quarter comes on the 20th, and finally the new moon, which you won't see, is on the 29th. Now, in the solar system, when you look down from the top of the solar system, the planets are going counterclockwise, Saturn is really on the other side of the sun from the Earth. So in the inner planets up in the upper left, uh, the third ring out, essentially above the sun, directly above the sun, is the Earth, this little icon for the Earth. And then if you look in the outer planets, Saturn is directly below the sun. So there are, you know, Earth, Sun, Saturn. So we won't be seeing Saturn this month. Jupiter is a morning planet. It's on that side, basically, of the line between the Earth and the sun. And everything else is an evening planet. So Jupiter in the morning. So let's start with Jupiter. 
Jupiter rises at 3.14 a.m. to 1.37 a.m. over the course of the month. So, you know, pi o'clock, at least in Michigan. Mercury has its maximum elongation on the 10th of December. Um, so it is as far away from the sun as possible. And this shot is on the 10th at 5.20 p.m. That's just a little after sunset. So Mercury is tight close to the sun, followed by Pluto, which sets at 7.32 to 5.38 over the month. Venus, which sets at 7.55 to 5.58 over the month. Mars, which sets at 10, and then by the end of the month, 8 uh, p.m. And Neptune, which is a little later, 11.58, almost midnight, down to 10 p.m. Um, so, uh, and uh, Uranus, which is 3.35 a.m. to 1.35 a.m. So that's basically how all of the evening planets line up. And you really should be able to see most of them. Well, uh, Neptune and Uranus you'll need to see with a uh, telescope, and Pluto you'll need to see with a fairly large telescope. Um, but they'll be all in one line there. On December 13th through, uh, and the 14th, we have the peak of the Geminid meteor shower. Now, we also have a full moon on the 13th, and the full moon is up all night, so it will wash out all but the brightest of the Geminids. Normally, we have a peak of maybe 120 per hour, so it's a really good show. It's as good as the, uh, the Perseids in the nice warm summer, at least in the northern hemisphere. But uh, this year, we'll, we will uh, not really see that many. 2 a.m., local 2 a.m., wherever you are, is the best time. It happens to be when uh, Gemini, Gemini, the constellation that they come from, is highest in the sky. Don't forget to dress warm, even if you're in the southern hemisphere, it gets cold. And that is What's Up in the Night Sky for December 2016.